So, what's the real play in town? That's what I ask people sometimes. What does that mean? What's the real play in town? Okay, where's the power? What is the controlling element in careers, life? It's money. Follow the money. That's what it is. I don't like saying it, but it's true. Uh, people come to me and say, hey, Jack, you know, what can I do to promote my career? <laughs> what new piece can I play? Um, well, it's kind of been there, done that kind of thing, you know? Um, I got lucky. I have to say I was blessed that Earl Wilde one day was in the Judd Concert Bureau office. Uh, Bill Judd invited us both in. And we were having meetings separately. I was going in after Earl was going in. Earl, for those of you who don't know, was a very, very famous virtuoso pianist who specialized in transcriptions, much like George Bolette, my teacher, my mentor. So Earl throws this score at me. He goes, hey, hey Richie, here, you might, you might want to do this. I think he'd be good at that. It was a transcription of the Rite of Spring, Le Sacre du Printemps by Stravinsky, right? And I immediately thought, yeah, well, wow, what a great work, but will it work on the piano? Well, of course, he said it's, he wrote he wrote the Rite of Spring at a keyboard, I think even at an organ. Um, the piece is highly rhythmic, no tremolandos and stuff like the Firebird, which, by the way, I played later on, another transcription by Sam Rafling. But let's not digress. He threw this transcription at me and said, hey, you know, you ought to do this. Well, my answer was, well, you know, Mr. Wilde, why don't you do it? You're the king of transcriptions. He goes, no, I don't have time. It's too big. It's too hard. I, I, I you know, do my list thing and my Porgy and Bess thing and, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into this diversion into the hinterlands with Stravinsky. And I was looking for a vehicle that could promote my career. I was looking for something because, you know, after winning the Nauberg, things die down. You know, you win the prize three years later, you have no concerts. It's just a, it's the nature of the beast. Unless, of course, you have the magic potion, which is money. And I mean millions. Hey, it's like running for president, okay? It's like running for the Senate. You have to have money and lots of it or you're not going to make it. Not big. You might have a mild to mid, fair to midland career but you're not going to have a big one like you know, a Yo-Yo Ma, Lang Lang, uh, uh, Joshua Bell type career or a Horowitz or to go back in time, a Horowitz, Heifetz, Milstein, Oystruck type career requires Funding Now, why does it require funding? I will tell you why. <clears throat> the hysteria that follows a success is just that. It's hysteria. Do you want to continue the hysteria? Yeah, most people do. They want to keep the furnace fueled with coal. Well, if the furnace keep, keeps the house warm, you got to keep shoveling coal into the furnace. Same goes with a career. If you want that fervor to continue after winning the Clyburn or after winning the Leventritt in the old days, after winning the Michaels, after winning the Leeds, after winning the Indianapolis string competition, you know, the famous one uh, that we have now on team winners of and nobody remembers the name. It's money that keeps you in front of the footlights, okay? They keep you in the limelight. Uh, I mean, they, the money keeps fueling the career. It's not your playing. Oh, no, I think I'm going to learn the Schumann F sharp minor sonata. That, yeah, nobody plays that piece, yeah. I think I'm going to be the first, uh, first Belgian to ever play the Paganini Caprices upside down. Uh, sorry, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. It's been done too many times. Now, I don't know of a Belgian artist that has played the Paganini Caprices upside down, but I do know a violinist that plays from a trapeze and from the silks, and sometimes upside down. She plays Sardis upside down. So um, it's been done, babe. It's been done many times. 
What's going to keep your name? I don't care what it is. Oscar Mayer, McDonald's, Burger King, or Lang Lang. It doesn't matter. It's a can of beans. A can of beans is a can of beans. To keep pork and beans, Van Camp's pork and beans before the public requires money. Lots of it. Now, you might say, well, Jack, I don't have lots of money. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, there is an alternative. The alternative is direct marketing, not advertising. Remember what I said earlier, if you were listening in another of these uh, vlogs, advertising says your brand is strong. It's the kind of thing that you've got to be seen where they think you're supposed to be seen. You're heard where they expect you to be heard on television or whatever. Uh, I'm driving down the street here in Tulsa and I see this big Coca-Cola neon sign. I mean bigger than life. And by the way, I've lived here nine years and I've seen it for nine years every day down 51. 51 is a, a, a highway. And I think to myself, wow. They're there every day, but guess what? If they weren't there one day, I would say, hey, what happened to Coke? Did Pepsi buy that sign? Did RC Cola buy it? I don't even know if RC Cola still exists. Oh yeah, it does now. I don't know, I don't know if it exists, but the point is, what would I do if Coca-Cola wasn't there anymore on, on Highway 51 going east towards Broken Arrow? Where would, what would I say? I t I'm just like every other person. I'm not extraordinary. I'm normal. I'd go, where's Coke? That's what I'm talking about. Your brand is strong. It says your brand is strong. Advertising says that. No, it doesn't get you more bottles of Coke sold or more uh, Big Macs sold or more Whoppers sold or more Rite of Springs or Tchaikovsky Concertos booked. What it says is your brand is strong. Whatever the brand is, if your name is John Henry, it says that John Henry is strong because he's being heard and seen where he needs to be or where people believe that he should be heard and seen. That's what advertising is. Now, you may not have heard it put to you this way, but it is what it is as a a friend of mine used to say, it is what it is, and it certainly is. I took the EST program once. This is, you know, to be, you know, uh, in French, EST, E-S-T means to be, right? It's the verb, whatever. And uh, there was a German guy who gave this training two weekends out of the year. It's called EST. And, you know, they, he had people crying and admitting things from their childhood. And it's sort of a, a you know, awareness breakdown type of uh, course where you're broken down, you start crying, you start admitting things to yourself and everyone else in the room. Well, naturally, I didn't. I took the course at the suggestion of one of my RCA recording producers, and uh, he, uh, I did not break down. I started laughing during the, all four sessions. I was just hysterically laughing like one girl got up and said, oh, it's terrible. I had sex with my father. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I've never had sex with anybody except, you know, uh, normal sex. OK, so I don't, I don't know what they were talking about. I couldn't relate to it. But of course, what is normal? Right. But what I'm saying is I took this program to kind of discover myself and I discovered that there was nothing to discover at that time. Now, when I did discover myself or find myself, it was through a metamorphosis or whatever you want to call it, a process that I did myself. I didn't pay $2,000 to go find myself. I did it myself. And I think everybody has to do that themselves. Okay? So to be, or it is what it is, but you know what I discovered in the S program? What is, is, and what isn't, isn't. That's what I discovered. I don't know if that's the point of the S program, and I don't know if they even have it anymore, but I discovered what is, is. That means right now I'm sitting in front of this camera 
right at this moment. There's nothing I can do about it. I can get up in the next moment and walk over there and be off camera. I can in the next moment take my suit off and do something else and put on some shorts and go jogging over there. But right now, I'm in front of this camera and there's nothing anyone can do about it unless I get up in the next moment and change that. So what is, is, what isn't, isn't. I'm not super famous. There's nothing anyone can do about that right now. I am not super famous. Can I change that? Yes. With a lot of money, with a lot of exposure, with a lot of maybe these things. I don't know. <laughs> the point is, I'm not super famous right now. That is what it is. I'm not super famous. People don't want to face what is, is, and what isn't, isn't. They want to be what isn't. They're not satisfied with what they are, which is what is, is. I, I don't understand that. But in a way, I can understand it because I've always wanted to be things that I'm not. But I'm getting to the point where I'm kind of satisfied with what I've done and what I am. And so that's what we're at, where we're at here when we talk about realize what you are or your limitations, if you would like, or your strengths. Realize your strengths, realize your uh, weaknesses, and maybe build from that point up. Take a weakness and make it into a strength. I hope you don't take a strength and put it into a weakness. That would not be so good. But anyway, that's basically what we're talking about here. Realize what is, and don't try to change it drastically. You can change it, but not immediately.